Good morning. How's everybody doing? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I can't let this service go any further, especially given what we are talking about, the way the stage looks, without doing something that I think we need to do. And so, if you are an active service member or a U.S. veteran, would you please stand to your feet for a moment? Thank you very much. Are you guys stay standing. Stay standing for just a moment. The rest of you that are seated, I can't break tradition. And so stand up real quick. Shake the hand of five people you didn't come to church with. If you're seated around one of the men or women standing, please thank them for their service as well. All right, you guys can be seated. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I'm usually hiding behind the scenes. I told Wednesday night, I said, because I'm the behind the scenes guy, I would share a little behind the scenes information. Wednesday night, the stage goes dark, the video's rolling, and as I'm coming out, carrying the stand, all I could think of was, please don't trip on barbed wire, please don't trip on barbed wire, because Scott went all out, okay? That's real. Don't touch it. So... Now, um, obviously, Pastor Brent is not here this week. He's given me the opportunity to continue this series. This is week number two of the series called No Man's Land. And every time I say series, because I'm using my iPad, Siri pops up. Thanks, Siri. Um, so, uh, so since he's not here, I want to say something that I say pretty much every time I get the opportunity to speak, because I think we all need to be reminded of it. And that is, please pray for your pastor. Nothing is wrong, okay? But please pray for your pastor. The target that is on his back all day long is a big one, okay? Satan would love nothing more than to discourage him, to take him down. And like I said, nothing is wrong. The church staff, the elders, we literally have to kick Pastor Brent out the door most of the time, okay? Because he loves you guys. He wants to be here. He doesn't like to miss. In fact, we were looking. Pastor Brent has spoken, I think it was like 62 times in the course of just the last couple of months. That's more than most pastors will speak in the course of a year. So again, pray for your pastor. He spent some time with Giovanna's family this week. Most of you know her mom's not been doing well. So continue to pray for them. Pray for her mother especially. I know they would appreciate it. Now, as I said, this is a series entitled No Man's Land. And basically, if you missed last week, the idea for this series came from our trip to Israel back in November when we were shooting the epic Christmas series. Now, we use this phrase a lot today. We use it in sports, anymore, politics. Um, but we use the phrase no man's land a lot, but the expression really became popular during World War I. And the reason why is this, is that during World War I, the two opposing forces, the German forces, the Allied forces, they dug trenches down into the ground, and from those trenches, they fought a war against one another. And the front line of these trenches could be anywhere from a couple hundred yards apart to as close as 150 feet apart. And so there was a gap of ground in between those trenches that was referred to as no man's land. It was essentially a killing ground. It was somewhere you did not want to get caught in because there was no protection there. And Pastor Ren alluded to this last week. The German forces, their trenches were well fortified. They were made out of concrete. They were well built. Many places they had electricity. But the Allied forces, when the trenches were constructed, they had no intention of staying there nearly as long as they did. So because of that, most of their trenches looked like this. They had dirt floors. It was either held back with metal or wood panels. There wasn't much to them. That being said, the Germans were actually really smart. A lot of times, the Germans actually had the high ground, the higher part of a field. And so what they would do is they would take water pumps and they would pump water out of their trenches, these concrete trenches, and they would send it down the field towards the Allied forces. So as if combat's not bad enough, the trench would fill with water and these trenches would become very muddy, sometimes knee high. Soldiers lost their feet in the war just from diseases, from the conditions that they were in. So 
it was a very miserable experience to be in the trench sometimes. So, like I said, it's a, it's a no man's land. It's a common expression we use a lot today. And over the course of the series, we're going to talk about different topics as it relates to this idea of no man's land. But today, as we get into this message, I want you to kind of imagine yourself in a trench. See, part of the problem with World War I was because the way the trenches were constructed, because of the nature of the battle that they found themselves in, it became very difficult for either army to take any ground. Because if you're an allied soldier, in order for you to go on the attack and go on the offensive, you would actually have to climb up out of the trench that you're in, cross through no man's land, and then attack the German army. So you can see this is extremely dangerous. So because of that, neither side really moved much. The front lines of the trench would attack each other, and then they would lay off. They would attack each other, and they would lay off. I heard a story recently that I thought was very appropriate for today. A young soldier, he had volunteered for the U.S. Army in 2002. After going through basic training and all that, he had weekend leave. And it was about a year later, and he decided he was going to take the opportunity to go home. And he went back to his home church and went for service. The pastor at the church saw him and saw that he was visibly upset. He was shaken. And so he asked the young man, he said, what's wrong? He goes, I've known you for too long. He goes, I know something is weighing really heavy on you. What's going on? The young man explained, he says, well, he goes, I just found out that it looks like my unit is going to be deploying to Iraq against the war on Saddam Hussein. And he says, to be honest, I'm not prepared for this. He said, I, I didn't sign up to go to war. And the pastor says, wait, whoa, 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 time out. He goes, you volunteered to be a soldier. You volunteered in the army and you didn't think combat was a possibility? And the young man said, well, he goes, here's the thing. He goes, really didn't have much. And so I signed up for the army to get an education. I signed up for the army for the health care. I signed up for the army for the discipline, the respect of the uniform, for all these things. But I never thought I would personally ever have to see combat. Now, some of you may think, well, that sounds a little crazy. I mean, it's kind of like a given. If you're going to join the military, it's a good chance you're going to see combat. Well, the reality is I think that's where most Christians live today. See, you go to church, you heard a pastor tell you about God's love, his grace, his mercy, salvation. It's a free gift, all those things. And they are, and it's wonderful. And so you go, that sounds pretty good. And so you just kind of casually put on a God uniform and you go, sign me up. But the truth is, is that it never went any further than that. Your relationship with God never went beyond that. And so you're just kind of casually wearing this God uniform. You're just kind of a casual, maybe benefits Christian, if I can say that. So this morning, I, I want to look at some things that I think are, are common sense. But I think either many of us have either never really thought about it or we don't take it seriously enough. And one of those is that the Bible over and over again refers to Christians, to believers, as warriors, to soldiers, as part of an army. And so this morning I want you to get that regardless of kind of where you are walking in this morning is that you are part of something way bigger than yourself. If you are a Christian, the Bible tells us that we are an army. Now, 2 Timothy 3 says, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 1 Peter 4 says, Beloved, do not be surprised in the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And there are numerous passages like this throughout the Bible that has this imagery of war. Now, when we think of war, we, we think of something like this. 
We think of guns, we think of ammunition, we think artillery, you know, we think physical fighting. But the war that the Bible describes is not a physical fight, but it's a spiritual fight, a spiritual battle. In fact, Ephesians 6, which we're going to go to a lot this morning, says it this way in the New Living Translation. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And I know some of you are going, well, this is great. I came to church. I was hoping to be encouraged this morning. Somebody's logged into Facebook right now. And they're like, whoa, okay. I wasn't coming here to hear this this morning. But this is reality that the Bible lays out for us. You know, I never served in the military. At one point, I was close to joining the Air Force, but that's another story for another day. And, but to me... The idea of physical combat is almost less intimidating than what the Bible is describing here. Because in most typical combat situations, you know where the enemy is. You have a pretty good idea where your attack is going to be pointed. You know where you're going. You know what the objectives are. But what the Bible's describing here is an unseen enemy. My wife and I, we joke all the time that our son Micah is fearless, okay? He's three years old. The kid is not afraid of nothing, all right? He finds like new ways every day to try to almost kill himself. I mean, literally, like, he's like, dad, look at the dresser. Wee! I mean, literally, I mean, you never know, all right? And so, I decided being a good dad, that I was going to take advantage of the fact he's not afraid of anything, okay? Let me just be honest with you. See, we just come off vacation a few weeks ago, and I was noticing that my three-year-old, almost four-year-old, is getting dramatically taller. So much so my wife would tell you she was laughing at me because, like, it was almost a daily thing. Like, I would go get a tape measure, and I'm like, okay, stand there, put your feet together, you know, and I was measuring to see how tall he was because just a couple of days before we left on our vacation, Micah hit 40 inches tall. You're like, okay. Well, that's a big deal when you go to Disney World, okay? <laughs> because at 40 inches tall, that means you get to ride the big boy rides, all right? So... Marcella, okay, if you don't know this, all right, like I said, we've got Micah, he's three, and Marcella is currently pregnant. We have a little girl on the way. And so, yeah. All right, can I let you guys in on a little secret? All right. When I saw what Scott did to the stage, I was like, hey, listen, when we're done with this series, can I have all this stuff? <laughs> Because the way I figure it, when the series is over, I've only got a couple of weeks to like get barbed wire up, dig trenches, and my yard is going to be no man's land. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyways, so, so Micah hits 40 inches tall. We're going to Disney, and I'm all excited because Marcella is pregnant. She can't ride most of the thrill rides right now. So now I've got a riding buddy. Now, she wasn't, you know, too excited about the idea, but I convinced her that I was right. So, um, so I took him and, and put him on these bigger rides, and two of them were two roller coasters at the Magic Kingdom, one of which you all know is Big Thunder Mountain, right? Everybody knows Big Thunder Mountain, okay? Now, in my mind going into this, I'm thinking he's fine. He's fearless. The kid literally is afraid of nothing. This will not be an issue. But as we're on the ride and we're click, 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 click up that lift hill, I'm going, please, Lord, don't let him freak out because I will never hear the end of this if he does. We get to the top of the hill and no joke, the kid puts his hands in the air and he's, yeah, and I'm going, yeah, I'm like, you're awesome. Seriously, I was like, this is great. I'm like, this kid is awesome. We pull back in the station. He is crying. He's in tears. And the cast members are, oh, did he get scared? I go, no, listen. And he goes, I'll go again. I will go again. 
man. Like he didn't, he was mad we were getting off. Okay. The kid, he's a thrill junkie. I'm like, this is amazing. I brainwashed him. So, so here I am, proud dad. We get off vacation. We get back home. We get into our routine, right? And it's late one night. He's been in bed for a little while. We just turn the lights off, kind of settle in. I'm laying there thinking, oh, this is so relaxing. It's been a long day. And just as I'm kind of ready to just close my eyes and fall asleep, dad, scared, dad. Stupid, scared. Coming, son. Um, so, okay, let's be honest, parents. When your little one is in the room and it's late at night, you've had a long day, and they're, oh, scared. You're like, let the monster eat you. You'll be fine. But so... <laughs> So anyway, so I go in his room and not knowing what I'm going to find. And I'm like, buddy, what's wrong? And I kneel down by his bed and he's pointing at his ceiling fan. And he goes, the fan, it looks like a spider. Really, dude? <laughs> See, what would happen is his room was dark. There was an ambient light coming in from a street light outside. It hits the fan. It casts a shadow. And it looks like a big spider across his ceiling. All right. So I reassure him, he falls back asleep. The next night we go through the same thing. Finally, it reaches the point he's walking into the room and literally when he enters the room now, it's the fan, it's a spider. So I finally, I picked Micah up and I kind of spun the fan blade a little bit and said, look, dude, looks like a helicopter to me. It's not a spider. He goes, oh, helicopter. It's totally my wife's idea. I wish I could take credit. So anyways, <laughs> but here's the crazy thing, okay? We take him to Disney World, put him on a roller coaster, and are terrified thinking this kid's going to freak out at the top of the lift hill when he sees what's coming on the other side. When he sees that drop, he's going to lose his mind. He was totally fine with that. We get him home. You put him in a dark room where he can't see what's around him, and he's scared to death. That's most of us, even as adults. You say, well, I don't know about that. It's the truth. Because we don't want to deal with the world around us that we can see. We look at what's going on on the news, in our backyards, in our family's lives, our friends' lives, and those problems, we don't even want to deal with that, let alone think about some unseen demon world that the Bible says exists. Hmm. You know, many of us... We're fine with the idea of angels. The Bible talks about angels. We're like, yeah, I believe in angels. Angels are beautiful. But we don't, we don't literally do not even want to acknowledge the reality of demons. But the Bible talks about them as well. So the truth this morning you've got to understand is that you are in a spiritual battle, that there is a war raging around you every single day, and that if you are in an army, you are in this combat zone, you need to understand that at some point, sooner or later, you will be attacked. See, one conversation I have a lot with new Christians especially is they get saved, they give their life to Christ, and they don't understand why suddenly it seems like bad things start to happen. They're like, wait a minute, I, I became a Christian, I gave my life to Christ. I should be in a perfect bubble. Everything should be great. But we know that that's not reality. Because what happens is, is that before you become a Christian, you're not a threat to anybody. You're just hanging out in the culture's fortified trench, doing your thing, minding your own business, and there's a war going on around you, but you're oblivious to it. But once you decide you want to be a Christian and you want to climb down into God's trench and be part of this army, you now have a target on your back. You're now part of an active combat zone, and there will be an attack. And here's the thing about it. Satan doesn't come at you in an obvious way. Okay, Satan doesn't come at you in a way that you see coming 10 miles away where you go, I'm about to be spiritually attacked. No. Instead, you'll be going through life and something will happen. Your family life will suddenly start to blow up around you. You'll be going through a situation that suddenly parts of your life that were stable and fine, suddenly there starts to be some issues, whatever it may be. 
That, I believe, is an attack. And the reason why it comes that way is because if Satan can get you to the point where you're looking around at your circumstances and things are no longer making sense, then he can discourage you and pull you out of the fight. If you're in a situation, you're down in the trench and you're going, well, life no longer makes sense and things just aren't adding up and I don't understand why this is happening and where's God in this situation, that's when most people throw up their hands and say, forget it, I'm done. But this is reality every single day. And for many Christians, it's not what we signed up for. We heard a message about God's grace, God's love, God's mercy, about salvation, and we're like, sign me up. I want the get out of hell free card. But that's not what the Bible says the Christian life is supposed to look like. So when you choose to put on this new uniform, when you choose to align yourself with God, when you choose that relationship with God, you are not only signing up as part of an army, you're climbing down into a trench in the middle of a spiritual battle. And if you are going to climb down into this trench, then one of the things that any combat vet will tell you, a key to survival is to stay alert. See, most of us, we go through our everyday life and when attacks come, that's when we decide, oh, I probably should do something. I should, I should, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I should get on guard. I, I, I need to find an answer. I, I need a weapon. I, and I need something. And that's why life falls apart around us. Because you're not prepared. You're not on your guard. You're not expecting anything bad to happen. We're just kind of casually going through life wearing our basically t-shirt hoping that everything's going to be okay. So Ephesians, again, I'm going to look at it in the message translation this time because I love the way it's worded here, starting in verse 13. It says, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. So take all the help that you can get. If you don't know this, this is why we gather as a church. To encourage each other, to love on one another, to hold each other accountable, to help each other grow to equip one another. As a new Christian, you can learn from the experience of somebody who's been a Christian longer than you. Now, the more I studied about World War I, the more I came across something I never thought would be the case. See, I discovered that during World War I, that boredom was actually a huge threat to a soldier. Boredom. Now, you wouldn't think that, right? We think war. We think, man, it's nonstop. And, and, and the whole time you're just praying to, to get out of there, to go home. But boredom was a real threat to a soldier during World War I. Because what would happen is you imagine yourself, you're down in one of these trenches, okay? It's muddy. It's nasty. There's disease. Deceased are around you. It's not a good place to be. So you're down in one of these trenches. Conditions are miserable, and suddenly the battle goes quiet. Well, when things would get quiet, that's when they would send reinforcements to the front line. They would send inexperienced soldiers to the front line to relieve those who had already been raging war. They would tell them, hey, keep your head down, be quiet, use this opportunity while we're not fighting at each other. Hey, clean your weapon, do all these things, get prepared, get ready to go again. Well, this would go on for so long that soldiers would literally become bored in the trench. They would be focused on the circumstances around them, how miserable it was, and they would kind of forget that they're in the midst of a war. If you're an inexperienced soldier, you've heard about the dangers. You've been told, keep your head down, be quiet, all those things. But if you can't see or hear the enemy, it becomes easy to do stupid things. And so if you look into this, you'll see that there's account after account in World War I of an inexperienced soldier who's bored out of their mind, finally reaching that point where they can't help it. They'll make a statement like, well, where is this enemy anyway? And they stick their head up over that wall and look towards no man's land. And that's when a sniper's bullet would end their life. How many of us know somebody 
who looked like they had their act together. They might be a Christian. Life is going great. And suddenly they make one stupid choice and their marriage blows up, their family blows up because they couldn't help the glance over into no man's land. They couldn't help the temptation to glance over, to look towards the culture, to see what's on the other side of this wall because I'm not crazy about what I'm going through right now. And that's when death comes. Now, if you're going to be part of an army, you're going to put on the uniform, yes, you need to be alert, but the most important thing in any combat situation is that you need to be armed. This is where all the carry permits holders say absolutely nothing. See, you're smart. Somebody said it, but I ain't pointing them out. Last night, was, amen! And I'm like, shh! <laughs> How stupid would it be if the soldier I told you about that was going to Iraq, if he had got on a transport plane to go to Iraq, and he's like, you know what? I'll just leave my weapon here. I don't think I need it. But we all do this all the time. We go through life totally unarmed, unequipped, unarmored, and ill-prepared. And we watch as life literally gets the best of us. Now see, I don't know about you, I'd rather not fight a war, but I definitely don't want to fight one unarmed. Now, Again, Ephesians 6, continuing this idea, verse 13, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Now pay attention to this. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, okay, if I'm in the midst of this scary spiritual war and all this stuff is going on around me and there's demons and angels and all this stuff that I can't see, I want a really cool weapon. And you're telling me that my weapon is the Bible. Yeah. Now, this right here, if you're going, uh, let's be honest, you just told on yourself. Because the Bible is more than just some book. Okay, the Bible literally is the key weapon in your arsenal. It is the only thing that you will need to get through this fight. Now, I get it. We live in a society today where, eh, we blow off the Bible. Ephesians here talks about truth. Well, we live in a culture that says, well, the truth is no longer the truth. People make statements like, well... I get what you're saying, but that's just my truth. You're an idiot. Because <laughs> here's the thing, okay? We live in a culture that says the Bible's irrelevant, that Christianity's irrelevant, we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know what we're doing, that none of this matters. If that is really the case, if the Bible is so irrelevant, if Christianity is so irrelevant, why is it the world cares so much about what it is that the Bible has to say? Why is it that the culture around us is so easily offended by what Christians believe if it's not true? I mean, you can say all kinds of things. Say whatever you want to. If it's not true, I don't care what you think. I'm just being honest with you. But if you want to see a really powerful weapon in action, speak the truth to somebody in love. Not grab a poster and pick it and this, that, and the other. One-on-one, -on -one, with somebody that you know, that you have a relationship with, speak the truth to that person and say, hey, listen, I know what you're going through. And can I just say something? Can I just share something with you that I think is relevant to your situation? Can I just tell you how God worked in my life in a similar situation? And trust me, if you will approach that person in the right way, speak truth to them in love, the reaction that you will get will probably not be the one you're expecting. Yeah, a few people may get mad, but for the most part, every time I found myself in that situation, 
I've been shocked at how receptive somebody really is when you come at them the right way with the truth from God's word. Now, it talks about peace and faith. Some of you know this, some of you don't. Marcella and I got married just a few months after we got married. We were caught off guard because she started getting sick. We didn't know why. She ended up getting a cancer diagnosis that made it to where she couldn't work. And so as a newlywed couple, we were down to one income. We were worried about paying bills, all those things. And it was a struggle. We finally got through that. She got better. We had our son. Life is good. Fast forward again a little bit. We find out we're pregnant again. It's unexpected. We're all excited. We're fired up. We get into this pregnancy and she has a miscarriage. People around us are going, how in the world are you not losing your mind right now? And I said, you know why? Because I know what God's word says. I know we're going to see that child again. I know this ain't the end of the story. So I'm not worried about it. The child is in better hands now than he would have been here on this earth. Take it a step further. Both of us have been in situations where we've had parents that have had serious cancer scares. She lost a family member just in the last month alone due to tragic circumstances. My dad is at Vanderbilt Hospital right now recovering from a surgery because of a severe burn accident that he had. This is life. This is the world we live in. And I tell you this because I want to make the point, none of us are exempt from this. All of us will go through this type of junk at some point or another. You just have to decide, am I going to be prepared for this or not? One of my awesome volunteers that's usually behind the scenes running the camera, Ken Atkins, he is down in Florida right now. A lot of you know Ken. About three weeks ago, Ken had a pretty serious stroke. He has been recovering Every single day, he's been working at it. Ken is a fighter, okay? The guy is, he, he's, he wants to come back and run camera already, okay? And I'm like, Ken, just let's get better. If Ken, if you're watching, Terry, hi, how are you? Um, but we love you. But, but the guy is a fighter. You think that situation's not hard on him and his wife? You think that's not discouraging? This morning in the first service, Sheila Matthews was here. Her husband, Jimmy, a lot of you knew, died tragically this past week. The Sampson family, the Bryan family, it's been in the news. Even if you didn't know them, you know their story right here in our community. This is life. And let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be able to make it through the things that we have been through if it wasn't for my relationship with Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for the peace and faith that come only through that relationship with Christ. Now, the last one on this list here is salvation. I alluded to this earlier. This is the, the big one that gets most of us hooked, right? When we first become a Christian, somebody told you about how you can be saved, and you're like, yes, that sounds great. Sign me up. I really don't want to go to hell. And here's the problem. Most churches, most pastors, a lot of times when you hear salvation talked about, it's talked about for future that that's someday. Salvation is coming. It's for eternity that you have to just get through now and then salvation will be later. But here's the thing. If you really understand what the Bible says about salvation, it will absolutely change your perspective on life. Because when you go through situations like I just mentioned, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, but you understand that this life is temporary that everything doesn't begin and end in this one moment, that the trial that you're going through today, this week, next week, whatever it is, when you understand that that's temporary, it changes your perspective and you begin to understand that the God that we serve, the God that wants a relationship with you, he's already in tomorrow, next week, the week after, and into your eternity. And that one day, all the junk that you're dealing with will be gone. None of it will matter. And he's going to give you complete victory over all of it. The problem is, if we don't understand God's word, if we don't understand what it says to us, we can't be victorious in this life. Because we're too busy getting attacked, too busy getting bombarded by the enemy. I want to introduce you to somebody. It's a World War I veteran named uh, Private Frank Veneer. Now, in this picture, Frank's 21 years old. Frank served on the front lines of Somme, France. 
He looks like he's about 12, but but about three year, or three months, excuse me, before he went on the front lines, Frank's dad gave him a really precious gift for his birthday. And it was a small pocket Bible. Now here's the thing. Frank loved this gift, okay? He carried it with him everywhere he went. He took it with him into combat, into World War I. He kept it right here in his front right pocket because he wanted that Bible close. It was the reminder of home. It was a reminder of the gift that his dad had given him. But more than that, the reason why Frank wanted his Bible close is because he knew the words that were on its pages. He cherished God's word. It meant something to him. So while Frank is fighting on the front lines in Somme, France, he said that he couldn't explain it. But all of a sudden, he just had this weird urge. The Bible just didn't feel right where it was. It was just something about it being on that side. And he just got this weird urge. And so he took the Bible out of his pocket, moved it over to his left side, closed his pocket back, grabbed his weapon. And he said, and in that moment, as clear as day, he said the words of Psalm 91 ran through his head. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but you will not be harmed. And he said, as soon as that happened, just immediately an artillery shell fell into the trench that he was standing in, just 20 feet from him, and it killed every soldier that was in that trench nearby. It knocked Frank to the ground. It blew his helmet off. It tore his uniform. And so as Frank is laying on the ground and he kind of collects himself and he, he's kind of looking, he realizes that he's not bleeding. Because what had happened is when that shell went off, a piece of shrapnel came flying towards him, but it hit the Bible that was in his pocket, tearing the Bible from cover to cover. But Frank left the war without a single scratch. And he went home from World War I, not shy about telling every single person that he came in contact with that the Bible had saved his life. Now, I know somebody here is thinking, well, wait, 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 okay, okay, I see where you're going. That's a nice story. Frank's lucky. That was awesome, but it's a coincidence. I don't think so because, honestly, I read about Frank's story before I found these pictures. And so I'm like, oh man, I got I to gotta share this story. I got to tell Frank's story. And so I do what we all do. I go on Google and, and I start looking, seeing, is there any photos of this Bible? Is there any photos of Frank that I can share with you guys? And in doing so, it took me a little while to find Frank's photos, but I ended up finding story after story after story, just like Frank's from wars literally fought going all the way back to the Civil War. A single Bible has saved the life of Private Leonard Knight, U.S. Army Private Francis Merrifield, British Private Leslie Friston, Private Arthur Ingram, Private Frederick Peel, Private Richard Best, Private Donald, Donald Morrison, Army Private First Class Brendan Schweigart. And if that's not enough, I'm going to throw this out there because it's the last service and I love you guys. Somebody told me, in between services today, that guess what? It was your grandfather, right? Fought in World War II. And guess what saved his life? A Bible stopped a bullet from hitting his heart. So here's the idea. We're going through life. We're getting beat up day in, day out. We're taking attack after attack. But we are so ill-prepared, we don't know God's word. And so when the attack comes, we are getting beat up. We are getting knocked down to the point where we just want to give up, quit, and walk away. But instead, if you will decide, you know what? I'm going to take this seriously. I'm going to dig into God's word. I'm going to allow it to begin to work in my life. I'm going to begin to memorize it. I'm going to begin to, to value God's word and make it a more meaningful part of my life. Allow it to encourage me to speak into my life. Guess what? When the attack comes, it's going to hit the promises of God that have already been at work in your life. And trust me when I tell you that God's word can take the attack. See, the problem is you and I, we're trying to fight a spiritual battle, but we're trying to do it on flesh and blood terms, and that doesn't work. 
This week, all I can tell you is do not allow your life or the life of your family members, your friends, your neighbors, coworkers, whoever it is, do not allow them to become a spiritual casualty simply because you were not prepared for the attack. Because we all know the attack will come whether we like it or not. And whether you're a Christian or not, the truth is, is that you're engaged in this war. But if you're not a Christian, you're just hanging out in the culture's trench, you're doing your thing, the war's raging around you, and you're like, eh, whatever. But the Bible says very clearly that one day this war is going to end. And when it does, those who have found their hope in Christ, those who have a relationship with Christ, will be victorious. And the culture in their fortified, strong-looking trench, they're doomed. So the question this morning is, which side are you on? Which trench are you in? Or are you like Pastor Brent talked about last week? Are you stuck somewhere in no man's land, in that middle ground? And here's the thing, guys, to take it a step further for a Christian in this room. There is coming a time when God is going to ask you to do something big, something bold. It might be sharing your faith, but it may be something way bigger than that where God is going to ask you to get uncomfortable and to step out and to do something huge in your mind. Where he's going to ask you to climb the wall of the trench, to cross no man's land, and take the attack directly to the enemy. But the problem is, is that most of us are getting killed just trying to stand our ground. We have no hope of going on the offense if we literally are barely surviving just trying to stand our ground. So what will it be? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you that your word is unchanging. That the standard, your love letter that you've written to us, God, is eternal. That God, well, most of us, we go through problems in life and we're looking around and we're trying to find the answers. We're trying to find meaning. We're trying to make sense of our situation. That God, that while we're scrambling to do those things, the culture is telling us, oh, here's an idea. Here, here's another idea. This is what I think. This is what I think. And God, the, those, those, those ideas, those supposed answers, those, all those things change on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. What was true last year is no longer true. What the culture thinks is right now was no longer right. All those things, God, it, as the Bible says, is shifting sand. But God, I thank you that we can instead choose to stand on your word and the promises that you have made us and know that they are lasting and they are eternal. And that God, that even though we are in the midst of a spiritual war, even though we are in the midst of of situations that will come our way, that we will get attacked and we will at times just feel beaten down, that God, that we can find hope and confidence and encouragement if we will turn to you, turn our relationship with you, turn to your word, And God, allow it to begin to affect us. And God, as we we face life's challenges, if we continue to lean on you, continue to look to your promises, God, that as the Bible says, we're going to armor up. That God, that we will be prepared to withstand the attacks that will come our way. Because God, we know that at the end of the day, that the life as we know it, And just with our blinders on and this world that we understand that, God, that this is just a fleeting moment, that this is temporary, and that, God, that you have something far greater in store for us, that you have eternity, you have have prepared something amazing for us. But, God, in the meantime, it is our job to be a weapon for you. It is our job to not only stand our ground, but, God, to step out to go on the offense, to share our faith, to to be an effective tool, an effective weapon for you, God, and to make a difference in our world of influence. So God, I pray for every single person in this room, whatever their spiritual habits are like, whether they are not reading your word or they're just kind of doing it or wherever they're at, God, I pray that this week that they would change their routine. I would pray that, God, that their relationship with you would go stronger, and I pray that they would read their Bible more, that they would pray more, that they would seek you more, and that, God, that through that, as life's problems, as these attacks come their way, that, God, that we would not only be able to withstand them, but, God, that we would be able to use these obstacles, these circumstances that we find ourselves in as a powerful tool to witness and to share our relationship that we have with you. And so, God, 
I thank you. Thank you for all that you've given us. I thank you for the cross, God. And I thank you that in a world that has no answers, that has no confidence, no hope to offer, that God, that we can boldly proclaim that the cross is literally all the confidence that we need, that its promise, God, is all that we need to face our day-to-day life. So God, I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.